Welcome to season three of An Hour or So With me, Sue Perkins. Well, we're back in lockdown, so we are continuing to record interviews remotely. We've got loads of great guests coming up, but today I have the venerable dame, Emma Thompson, don't you know? I always like to start off with a dame. There's nothing like it. Uh, We discussed, to begin with, how she's been coping with the stress of COVID. Yes, it's true. When I'm down and I'm blue. What is your coping mechanism during these times? Um, Actually... It's um, breathing. Breathing? Yeah. Breathing. Deep, deep breathing. Deep, proper breathing. Yeah. Lots of that. that. And lots of sitting. It would be very good for you, Sue. Pranayama breathing. Look it up. I've heard of it. Somebody yeah. tried to get me into it. and uh, i got to tell you, it would really help. I think it's going to be better than diazepines and beta blockers and marijuana. Um, or I is it? So. Well, beta blockers are great, but um, yeah, really good when you need them. But breathing really is helpful. And um, so when I get a bit flooded with it all, which happens, worrying about everybody and dealing the whole school meal and children thing at the moment is so desperate. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's what I do. So I, I'm. I go back to the simplest possible thing, which is just sitting very, very quietly on my own somewhere, breathing. I mean, we can't not talk about... Now you've mentioned school meals, I can't not talk about it. I should probably mention we are recording this on the 27th of October. Mm. Um, I say that in the vain hope there'll be some U-turn. People will go, God, Another listen to U-turn. them chatting. Yeah, but they won't be. I think, there, I think there may be. There's a, um, the Food Foundation, Marcus's um, lot... I've got a petition up and there's nearly a million signatures on it. Hmm. So um, I saw Deb Francis White the other day and she said, do you want to do an emergency Guilty Feminist podcast on it? And I said, that would be great. And we could talk to the young ambassadors from the Food Foundation of all all kids who've suffered this, this um, food insecurity, they call it, in the sector. You know, but basically it just means that these kids have have often and many a time just gone hungry, not gone to school without any any breakfast and we've been hearing stories about that for a long time but I think I think I think folk find it very difficult to believe and I don't blame them but unfortunately they perhaps aren't uh, you know when it's very difficult to be aware of this kind of modern poverty and the fact that even if you're on your universal credit even if you've got a job you just can't earn enough to feed your family or feed them well and so Yeah, and I wonder where we got to this stage where blame became such a significant sort of driver in Mm. modern discourse. So so immediately, I noticed this very profoundly on social media, Mm. parents came in for a slew of abuse. Mm -hmm. For what? For trying to feed their family and through circumstances beyond their control, not being able to do so. And then, of course, you have an MP saying, well, I've seen people in my constituencies selling food for drugs. Yes. Like you're suddenly going to buy four grams of weed with a Frey Bentos. It's not happening. That's not really happening on the street. No, and I wonder where he actually saw them or whether he, you know, maybe he was just trying to try buy some drugs. One can only hope. But, I mean, I yeah, it's, um, it's not a good situation. And, oh, Marcus Rashford, I was up in Manchester with him the other day doing a, a bit of filming. And, um, of course, he was just incandescent with fury and um but but really good i mean really so articulate and and very interesting about his mum of course who did have a job and had all these boys four i think and just worked 14 hour shifts came home there was a slow cooker he would eat but when he was training when he was little he'd just eat cereal all day because there was nothing else so it's not about and I did, I did a, a something on the radio on the re, on the radio four about a year and a half ago about this very subject and got that from one of the presenters from Justin Webber. And he was, isn't this? Um, he said, um, it's it's feckless parents. So actually, the, the blame I... thing is Dickensian. I mean, that's from Dickensian times. And the I thought we'd moved that. away from that. You well, know? I think we're tracking right back. I mean, I, I, I the the more the more that it's in the sort of public eye as it should be, the more I'm thinking about my own childhood, 
and you know the 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 milk snatcher days you know the idea mm. that mm. um what's best is that we take feeding children or helping those in poverty away from local government and actually to put it in the hands of the private sector and um when that happened in the 80s of course nutrition just fell through the floor um everything was done on the cheap and if we've learned anything from this this crisis i would say that everything health related and that includes feeding kids uh, is is done through public health through through well funded centralized bodies that aren't going to pass judgment on families doing their best it makes me very angry no, absolutely what was the first thing that got you furious it doesn't have to be political but the, the first um, sort of prickle of injustice when you were little oh when i was little um it was school it was it was there was a girl in our class who was um you know she had some clearly quite a, an unusual set of parents and for instance she would sit in the any kind of sex education or biology biology with her hand her fingers in her ears humming loudly you know so there was a there was something going on there and she had a quite odd appearance you know she looked very kind of old in a way and she was very badly treated by um some of the girls so I took to sort of trying to protect her because I I couldn't stand I really couldn't stand it and I think that I think there is some folk I met a couple of them actually a couple of the young ambassadors who work for the food foundation actually aren't they haven't been through it themselves but they have seen and witnessed um shaming and bullying and they don't understand it and they feel a, a deep urgent need to do something about it and um i've always had that i think um yes i i i agree i mean i think my my first experience of of bullying wasn't being bullied myself but seeing it happen around me and that deep mm. deep sense of disquiet that it creates because it could be you it could be mm. you and i'm sure you know as an adult uh, people have tried to make it me and i've resisted it um i mm. wouldn't say as successfully as you've done i have huge anxiety as a result but Yes, that idea of hang on, if we allow the marginalisation of this one person, then when you've finished with her or him, then who's going to be next? Because the fire isn't going to burn out. Um, mm. Absolutely, absolutely. But it, it, it's still, and, and I have you know nieces and, and godchildren who have intermittently gone through things that are just overwhelming i mean things that we didn't have to deal with when we were kids particularly because of social media no. you know the idea that bullying mm. is viral within within a post you know within a click oh yeah i mean it's incredibly dangerous and everyone's got to watch the social dilemma because that's very interesting hearing all the young white men um of silicon valley saying well we wouldn't allow our kids onto these things and speaking so articulately about what this is what we've got ourselves into with social media because there were the people inventing it made it addictive on purpose yeah. it was made addictive on purpose and when when people within the industry said excuse me i think we need to be a little bit more um, aware of what we're doing here because this is addictive um, they were shut down and ignored I, mean, I think it's there's no you know there's no, no small sense of irony in knowing that that it was a, originally the internet was a sort of military based kind of intranet kind of system and it is it is it has yeah. weaponized society it's weaponized you against yeah. me I mean not you specifically but but um but you know it it, it it has highlighted division and inequality and permitted fury and hate speak and all sorts of stuff um, just so that we can um, Google, you know, Wikipedia, you know, get w wiki results quickly. Exactly. I mean, I think that on the other hand, um, discussions and debates having died completely, almost completely in the public arena uh, are now happening in podcasts and um, social media arena that there, there are some um, discussions going on that I think are new and different and that I find very hopeful and I think Generation Z are hip to the algorithms a little bit more than we are certainly I mean I think you you know I'm 61 and I look at it all and go I don't get it I don't like machines but then i I wouldn't, would I? Because I didn't grow up with them. But my daughter says, Mum, I know this stuff. I know what they're doing. 
And I go, really? Okay. Uh, and, and I don't understand. They just, they just have a, 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 a relationship with what I see as something fantastically baleful that is quite sort of dismissive, really. I mean, she's quite contemptuous of the algorithms that make her buy things yeah. and make her So she knows she's things. being profiled or that she's very aware. She's aware of it, yes. And, and clearly, well, either she's, you know, going to suddenly throw the phone out the window or she's going to make it work for her. I don't know. But this generation, her generation, I think, who, who were the guinea pigs, frankly, mm. um, they're the ones who are going to change it. They're the ones who are going to turn around and say, we cannot conduct ourselves like this anymore. And our social media platforms have to have controls on them. They absolutely have to, clearly. Yeah, and it's, we, we took millions of years to be able to stand upright. And yet... The moment yeah. now that my uh, baby niece was able to walk, she went up to the television and tried to swipe right with it. So that's happened in that's so, you know, that, you that evolution, that technological evolution, and the way it's impacted us. But it impacts everything. It impacts the way we think. You know, there's a if you've read it, there's an interesting book called I think, The Shallows, which is about how our brains are obviously plastic and the internet has basically reduced the bandwidth of our concentration span and our, our, our sort of capa memory capabilities. Indeed. But also physiologically, we don't move so much. We're just sat, you know, calcifying, looking at, you know, yeah. pornography or in my case, gems of war, which is something I got very heavily involved in during <laughs> lockdown. <laughs> Okay. which is a child's game oh, I'm on all the discord chats about with loads of fellow gamers and I've got pseudonyms coming out my arse and, and I just look at this shit and I thought god I could be doing something if I just put some <laughs> pants on and went outside I could be doing so, so I speak as somebody who's been slightly reeled in but yes. uh, but is also like you terrified of the whole thing this episode of the podcast is sponsored by harrys.com. Now, if you haven't heard of them, Harry's is a subscription service for men's shaving products at affordable prices. The company was set up by Jeff and Andy, who were just fed up with overpriced razors and set out to fix shaving. To do this, they bought their own factory in Germany, which has been making blades for 100 years. They've just released their sharpest ever blades with a new lubricating strip, don't you know, for an even closer, more comfortable shave. And the best part? Harry's have not raised their prices, so you can get replacement blades for as little as £1.75 each. Listeners to this podcast can now get a trial set for just £3.95. Go to harrys.com forward slash hour to get started. The set includes a weighted ergonomic handle, the new five blade razor cartridge, shave gel and travel blade cover to protect your blades on the move. You can also check out Harry's range of face care and hair products, as well as their shave and shower travel kits. Get the comfortable shave you deserve. I'm looking a bit shaggy myself. Maybe I'll get some. Head to harrys.com forward slash hour to claim a trial set for just three ninety five, And you'll also be supporting our podcast by doing so. So thank you. But I'm very impressed by some of the young women gamers I've heard speaking on various podcasts and they talk with it because they receive the most extraordinary amount of abuse when people find out that they're women and you go huh so because Laura Bates has just brought out that book hasn't she about the sort of misogyny yes. um on the net and and the dark net and everything and and I find that very interesting because I years and years ago when I first became a kind of card carrying feminist my mum said well women just aren't very popular at the moment and I think she was referring to <laughs> but at the moment did she mean since since the dawn of time <laughs> well yes yeah, she was sort of she's fond of saying well we're barely out of the slime which is true but also she said um that as we moved into the workplace which we know um we became less and less popular and misogyny rose and rose and it seems to be at record heights at the moment in particular in a particular kind of male environment you know, it's only particular kinds of men. It's quite niche, but it's very pervasive and it's um, and, and quite powerful and quite convincing to an awful lot of men. It's so it's important to be aware of it. But I find if I get too aware of it, I get a bit um, paranoid. Yeah. But it's also important to and balance things, isn't it? I mean, also you're able to balance. Yes. 
your work and your activism with the fun, most fun job in the world. I hope you still find it. Exactly. Uh, do you still find it fun? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Is I it still playtime? It is it is completely playtime. I mean, obviously, it's... Well, it is... I just did a job for Disney, which was such good fun. It was Cruella with um, with Emma Stone, and I was playing her nemesis. And, and that and in, in the biggest wigs I've ever Fabulous. worn and the biggest <laughs> costumes I've ever worn. So, uh, I mean, it was getting into the makeup chair at four o'clock in the morning and just and swanning on to set five hours later six pounds heavier uh, and that was just the mascara so that that you know it's um the playtime bits are fantastic and then the prep bits take a long time um but it's so it's so much fun and i i i love my my day job it's fantastic what would you have i mean was it something that you is it is it in your blood? Do you actively consider it? Like people can't believe when people say I fell into it, but I do think a lot of creative people fall into it in that they just they want to do something that interests them. They want to tell stories, but they don't have a formalized sort of direction. That, uh, that, that no. I mean, for example, for me, I, I I had no idea what I wanted to do other than just I was really curious. So I wanted to be around mm. people, and I wanted to find out mm. everything all at once. Mm-hmm. And it just so happens that that was the channel I found. There could have been multiple other channels or I could have ended up in prison. But... Um, mm. we, we, it's true. But you weren't sciencey, so you couldn't have gone to be a marine biologist. No, instance. but but increasingly I am sciencey, which is what's brilliant yeah. about getting older is you think, OK, it wasn't, as I was led to believe at the time, a lack of intelligence. It was very likely a lack of application. But also I wasn't taught some subjects I weren't taught wasn't taught very well and there's a formula there's a there's a way into science that if you're not given at an early age it's it's gone but now I find pure mathematics uh extraordinary inter- extraordinarily interesting I find the cosmos cosmology really you know all those sorts of things string theory I don't I can't say that I really understand all of it time mm. why does time move at a different rate in the in the mountains than it does on mm. the plains mm. all that stuff but yeah, I, I wasn't at the time sciencey, so you're right. It, it, I was always heading towards a very nondescript beige second class honours degree in English literature. <laughs> now I see it. Yeah. You know, um, but at the time it felt more haphazard than that. No, I, I, I think you're right. We were also told when we were young that um, you were either arts or science, yes. which is just nonsense. Were you ever science? It's not. Did you ever get into. No, but I liked maths because I had a good maths teacher. And I didn't like physics because my physics teacher was a sadist. So, um, you know, I can't, I can't say, I, I love physics now. Like you say, I get really intrigued by it. I'm so curious about it. And yes, cosmology. My daughter-in-law studying astrophysics. It's completely amazing, yeah. all of that. And I'm very sorry that I, I didn't have more access to, to those ideas. But anyway, look. We are who we who we are because of what we come into contact with as we grow up, and there's 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 nothing to be done about that. You've got to come into contact with something, and you can't push yourself in every single direction at once either. I mean, I think that unless you're Voltaire, obviously, but hardly anyone is, yeah. I find. Um, so I, yeah, I was at school in Camden Town. And it happened to be a school that taught classics very well. So weirdly, Latin was my favourite subject at school. What did you study? You didn't study classics, did you? Or did you? No, I studied English literature. But classics gives you such... I love... I'm obsessed with classics. I mean, I don't... I don't... Yeah. I, 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 Latin. Latin. It's just literally the most fabulous thing. And it's the thing. foundation of so much else. But also the, that, that yeah. gets you into mythology. And once you're into mythology, oh. then you have opened That's up... That's the best. ...the most fantastical, you know, space. I return to that yeah, all the because time. It, Yeah, the mythology is absolutely... I was obsessed with it when I was mm. 13. And my Latin teacher, I'd, I'd, I'd ask her to give me extra questions on on any kind of myths. And I would do little quizzes and uh, and she did it god bless her she she had a whole class it didn't occur to me that I was just adding to her workload but I was completely fascinated by myths because they were so 
disconnected from the, you know, the very kind of meat and potatoes Christian culture that that existed in my school. It was very straightforward and, and you know, doubtless splendid in its own way. Um, but I found myths kind of led you off in all sorts of different directions. And you thought, he did what with who? She slept with the, her father? Her you know, hair is so snakes. Much, what? Her hair is snakes. What? He's really got good. horse's legs. What the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck has he got horse's legs for? What's he going to do with them? He chopped her own dad up and threw him in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> It is a, it, great, great women. Oh my god! Yeah, and then that's um, I'm trying to think what my favourite. Do you have a favourite myth? I'm trying to think what mine would be. Oh god! There's... But there's but the, it they, it connects to every part of life, and I guess the thing that I got most out of when I studied in the brief window that I did study when I was at college was um, Greek tragedy, because again, the, mm. the, that mythology, as you say, very very strong women. And you know, it's mm. sort of Cassandra, the 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 most oh. the the epitome of of all female experience. She's just saying, "This is going to happen. No one's yeah. listening to me. No one's listening to me. No one's listening to me. It's happened. I told you so. Now I'm going to be the bitch that just goes around fetching, saying, look, I told you this was going to happen.'" Cassandra is tops, isn't she? Cassandra's poor cow, poor honestly. Cow. And that was her curse. Her curse was to see everything and never to be believed. I mean, that is just extraordinary, isn't it? To be put, what a clever curse as well. It's I so mean, if you want to make someone's life miserable, fiendish. those goddesses, those goddesses, they knew how to really fuck people up, didn't they? They really did. But in really, like, like really <laughs> original and interesting ways. I mean, oh. It's true. Like, sometimes it was, it, sometimes it was base level. Sometimes it was like, no, turning into a swan. But <laughs> yes. then that's quite good as well, because swans very, very limited to hissing and being forced yeah. with bread that they don't want. They don't want. <laughs> they, they nutritionally, don't want it. it's useless to them. Yeah, and they're, uh, they're, it's only leading them towards being eaten by queens. Yes, exactly. They'll end up, <laughs> they'll end up on a royal platter, and that's, <laughs> that's very lucky. Um, and, and people of limited imagination will constantly use them as a reference point for feeling stressed on the inside, but not expressing it on the outside. Or is that ducks? I can't remember. Stephen Swans can't even lay claim to that. It's, uh, you know. I remember once an awful scene on Hampstead Heath where a man had tried to catch a swan to eat it. Really nice guy, but just says, oh, no, well, I was going to catch a pike, but I ended up catching this, and that's okay. And people, <laughs> this bloke came along and just went, only the queen, mate. Knock it. <laughs> you know, knock it. Knock it on the head. They're not even very nice swans, so I To they? eat? Bit fish. No, a bit greasy. I've eaten the peacock. Fishy. I don't fancy it. Oh god! I've eaten a pig. I mean, I don't eat any of it now. I'm vegetarian, but it, it, it's no. um, it was an awful situation, to be honest. I was doing this thing, and we were eating everything, and and somebody said, "Oh, in the Elizabethan era, they used to make these. I think they were called cockatrices or something. You know, it's when they have, you know, one bird stuffed into another, and then they put a mouse's face on a boar's anus, and suddenly it's got wings. It's like, oh, isn't this wonderful? And look, Jeffrey, the small person's popped out of a pie." So we were trying to recreate something of that on a quite limited BBC factual budget at Penshurst Place. And they were lamenting the lack of peacock. And then two hours later, some farmer says, I hear you wanted a peacock. This little shit has been annoying me for years. And he'd just gone and oh. shot it. So there was a lot of footage of me sort of very balefully sort of weeping and sort of mourning it. And then we, then it was overcooked and served to us. I don't, I don't oh. recommend it. It was awful. It was really awful. I've done terrible things that I feel... Now I've said that, I just feel nothing but sadness. And now oh, I've given that to you, yeah. that feeling, and that's where we're left with. It's quite funny. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll try and carry it with you for the rest of the day. <laughs> and then we'll have to let it go, Sue, because that's really what has to be done. This is what I can't has do. All done. right, OK. So the mm. letting go you is... You have to let things the, go. The, the receiving, the animus, the energy of the experience, I can deal with that, yeah. doesn't ever dissipate. I can get as wound mm. up by a thing that I saw in India in 2016 now as I did at the time. Mm. And it doesn't process. Well, that's the problem with memory. You know, that is the problem with memory, is that unfortunately it, it, it would be great, wouldn't it, if you could have your memories, but they wouldn't drag everything that you felt at the time along with them 
Do you see what I mean? If you could remember things without yes. the attendant emotions, yes. then it would be interesting. And that, I suppose, is perhaps a, a trick that one could learn. Is that Buddhism? It's basically Buddhism, yeah. I remember, yes. I think, I think it's, it's, it's feeling the, allowing the flow of time and experience to pass by with a certain degree, depending on what type of Buddhism, I think, of detachment. Yes. Yes, I suppose so. I can't detach from anything. Yes, it's, I know what you mean. It's very hard. It's very hard. And I do think it's probably um, a, a, like a muscular discipline. It's probably something you can learn, you can teach yourself to it feels do. feels brutal, though. Do but, you do that? I can't do it. Mm, um, what do you mean brutal? I sort of feel that abandoning the emotional feeling behind an event is a sort of turning one's back on the effect or purpose of it. But say the emotional feeling that something that happened, let us say, two years ago, and it made you feel terrible. Mm. What's the use of you feeling terrible two years later when it's over and no longer actually relevant? I'm not talking about remorse. Mm. That's, that's absolutely right. But once you've had the remorse and you've felt it and then you've either done something about it or made amends or done what you can, is it any use thereafter no. to feel it over and over and over again? I think it's quite debilitating, actually. Yes, it is. I imagine. <laughs> but I always take, I, so for example, I mean, well, like Exodus and mine really laugh about it. I'm always a good five years exiting a relationship. Oh, and, and yes. I say, look, you know, it's, I mean, uh, it's sometimes it's a mutual thing, sometimes it's me, sometimes it's them. But the, just the period of mourning and, oh, I don't know if I've done the right thing. Let me just go back and I ask think them. That's okay. And then they're so pissed that's off. All right. They're so pissed yes. off all yes. the time. So I'm such a prevaricating prick. Um, but it always ends out fine because we're always we're always all mates. Thank God. There's no there's no recrimination. There's no. But it's just no. It's so tiring. It is tiring, and I I mean I think that I think that that makes you just someone who takes relationships seriously. Uh, you think of all the people who end relationships and then just that's it. They're over. That's oh, but probably I that. not good either, is it? But there's a kind of there's a kind Did of clarity you? of thought. I mean, I sort of. I've been talking about this a lot at the moment. I think there's a certain kind of empathy, which is mm. very, very productive. Yes. Which enables you to experience with with a, with a, with a detached curiosity somebody else's yes. life mm. and to be mm. able, if you can, to help. And then there's, I think it's called somatic. I might be wrong. Someone will correct me. Empathy, where you're so drowned by somebody else's experience you are completely fucking useless and i mm -hmm. suspect i fall into the latter camp although i am trying well yeah i mean i think that empathy is incredibly important and it's probably the most important thing that we need to introduce into our structures and into our institutions actually um because it's what's lacking i suppose from the ways in which we've developed society, so social institutions, should we say, and our cities, shall we say. Um, empathy, is, it's very important. I, I, I was, I've been thinking about this a lot, thinking about what kind of city would you build? You know, if you're feeling empathy for people, that is to say, if you are able to imagine what it is like to be someone else who has a difficulty, mm who has a problem, who is suffering, yeah. which is what empathy is. In my, it's what I experience. I'm able to imagine it and therefore I'm able to sympathise. So it's a kind of make a bond. Then I would say you make you build cities so that they're comfortable for babies and very old people who have to use a wheelchair. And if, you, if the cities are comfortable and pleasant and delightful to be in, for those two class, classes of human being, then everyone in the middle will be fine. No one will have to worry about anyone. Everyone else will be fine because the most vulnerable people have been put, been considered first. And that's a sort of city built on empathy. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by June's Journey. Now, June's Journey is a captivating hidden object mobile game, which is free to download from iTunes or, as I did, from Google Play. 
The game is set in the roaring 20s and it looks stunning. So, we follow amateur detective June Parker through beautifully crafted scenes and try and solve the mystery of her sister's murder. It's a perfect escape when you've got five minutes to spare and you need a break from the stresses of everyday life. I've been playing it loads over the last few weeks. It's a good way to relax, but also it tests my observational skills as each scene is a new challenge, finding those hidden objects and discovering more about the murder of Claire and Harry. The hundreds of colourful scenes keep the game fresh and vibrant while the lightly challenging puzzles keep even my brain active and engaged. It's the perfect balance of relaxing and challenging after a day of recording podcasts. I say a day, as we know, because I called the title this. It's really just an hour. If you enjoy puzzles, murder, mystery and great stories, this game is perfect for you and you can download June's Journey now for your phone or tablet from either iTunes or Google Play by clicking the link in the description of this episode. And I'm assuming your city, which I'm now making you sort of king, queen's, president, god, ruler, elite of, um, or or just a very conscientious board member in a democratic sort of socialist... Set up whichever you or, prefer. Or, you know, a benign dictator. I'm, benign I'm, dictator. They get they get shit done. Let's face it. They do. They get shit done. So you up. would. I know you would make it green. So your city would be mm. carbon neutral. Plenty of green spaces. Mm. Big set of green lungs in the middle of it. Um, yeah. What would your broad education policy be? I mean, we we've talked about free school meals. That's a given now. Yeah. Oh, oh, lots of things. God. Well, there'd be lots and lots of information about what life is actually like <laughs> in the sense that for instance um what where do people keep their electric meters and where <laughs> does gas come from <laughs> and how do you bleed a fucking radiation i have no idea you know and when those little brown envelopes come through that's your bill but of course my my city wouldn't have that kind of thing it wouldn't have a brown envelope arriving nothing would be impersonal in that way because everything would well, be man or run woman. and controlled by people so put women to come to the door and say you owe us some money but that's more that's bailiff territory no 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 it wouldn't be like bailiffs it's not not a sort of um it's not a a a, a threat it's that every time you ring the people who put your gas in, you speak to somebody who you probably know. So that all of the pods that, that are built and, and the buildings and the, everybody knows where, where the, the stuff is that controls the water and the gas and the electricity. And it's, it's really sort of shared information and that all the practical things that mm. none of us can do, that we know nothing about, we would know much, much more about because we'd have learnt about it from when we were little. And if I might suggest, I mean, you're the dictator, I'm merely... You're merely a serf. I'm a serf slash... Re- <laughs> See, I have, I'm surf, very, look. very happy with that. You've no idea how comforting it is to be just lower orders dog's body with no sense of responsibility. I'm going to really. I don't lean want in. the responsibility. I don't want it. Can I just say now? I well, just you've don't just want said it. you're anyway. the dictator. But I would also say um, one thing that you can do in your ideal city is to make, is to introduce sex education at a at a at an, at an, at an appropriate but early age, so that oh, very early. intimacy very early. and consent and mm. respect are normalised with within sexual relationships. That I think would be very early on. Really early on. I, uh, I I did a little sex manual for my daughter when she was about eight. I I, drew I need. To, I was going to say I, I need some detail. I did a little sex manual. <laughs> well, she'd asked me about what happens when people um what, what, how babies were made, and she was very little. I remember I was sitting at my desk and she was about the same height as me sitting down. So I suppose she must have been nine or something you know and and I said okay well I show and I did some drawings um and I said okay this is this is the female business and this is the male business and this is this could be quite alarming um but this is what happens and she looked at me for after I'd explained this and done my little drawings Mm. she looked at me with a very sort of a level gaze I would put it like that and said I knew you'd tell me the truth now telling the truth to children at the right time is very much appreciated, mm. I think, and terribly important. And and I thought, okay, if you're thinking about this, I'm going to make a little book. And I made lots of little gingerbread men, women, people, forms, human forms. And I said, 
inside your body, you will feel things and you will feel things in different parts of your body. And, and that means something very, very important because that those feelings are instinctive feelings and you need to trust them. You absolutely need to trust them. So if you have a funny feeling that's a bit buzzy and gray and uncomfortable in your stomach, then something's wrong. And you need to listen to that and you need to learn not to suppress it. Because if you listen to it, you'll be, you'll, get away from the situation or you alter the situation and you won't feel it anymore. But a lot of us, particularly women, um, have been taught to suppress those uncomfortable feelings um, because we don't want to be rude or we don't want to be impolite or, or, or be seen as um, strident or whatever it is. Uh, and um, uh, as well, I said, you know, you, you, you're going to have feelings in your throat, in your chest, in your stomach and in your loins. And, and they're all going to be telling you different things. And sometimes they'll all come together, be telling you the same things. And that's the person you need to go to bed with. God, I wish, I, I wish my parents things. had been like you. <laughs> i tell you what I had. I mean, that's, and, 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 that, and I genuinely, <laughs> no, I know, I hope you know well enough to know that there's no sort of arse licking involved here. It, genuinely, that is the best thing you can give a child is a sense of their own agency and to trust their sense yes. of it, their, their own instincts. So I was brought up uh, in, a, in a sort of Catholic household. I brought up a little, for a little while with um, by nuns. And um, they'd obviously advised my parents. We had a sort of family encyclopedia. They'd advised them to <laughs> cut out, which my dad did rather dutifully before he became an absolute tub-thumping atheist and told them all to go fuck themselves. But he had dutifully, with a Stanley knife, cut away the pages on sexual reproduction. I know, because I looked for them constantly. And I must have been quite young, probably, probably the... the, the sort of around about yeah. the, the eight, nine, ten mark. And there was there was an absence of information. But you know, and it listen, it turned out fine, but it's it's uh, I, I do think it's an incredibly important thing that parents have to lean into. And by, I, I, I said about my mum talking to me about sex and me just sort of waiting for ages and then just going, That ship has sailed now, Mum. It's just like where have where have you been? <laughs> I, I've yeah, been how old were you? About thirty two. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. But I think, oh, I don't, yeah, I mean, but I wish I had had those conversations. And I think if I'd been lucky enough to be a parent, I think I would have definitely gone exactly the same way you did. Look, it's really confusing and weird and you'll make mistakes. And sometimes they'll be really painful. But the mistakes that you don't have to make uh, are when you feel something's not right and you pull away from it. And it doesn't matter how yeah. bad someone else makes you feel for doing that. If it's not right, it's yeah. not right. Yeah, exactly. It, exactly. It's, it's, it's vital. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the fun of it, of course, is trial and error, you know, but but you have removed the pain. That is also true. Pain. Yes. I mean, it's the, the error I'm passionate about, particularly young people um, of whatever gender avoiding is, you know, being exploited sexually because it's very easy to do. It's very easy to do. Hmm to groom somebody or to make them feel good and they're in a, possibly in vulnerable situations in their own families and but they can't follow their instincts they can't it's too difficult for them but that's fine because in your benign dictatorship sex education has been sorted and yeah absolutely and people would not be and there wouldn't be prisons and all that sort of malarkey and essential work would be um really the the, the, the nurses and doctors would be the people who got paid the best and essential work would be really valued and and it would be so much better. It, you know? it would be so much better. And I'm sure there are economists, particularly those sort of centre-right or right who will place some fault on our utopian model. I mean, admittedly, we haven't sketched out the numbers. No, we haven't sketched out the numbers. And also, if you speak to feminist economists... They would say, OK, well, we're talking about I mean, obviously, we're having fun here, but they're talk we're talking about circular, sustainable economies. We're talking about the removal of profit as the number one priority of every single institution business on the planet. That's got to go. It's an old model. It's dead. And it's not serving anyone except a very, very few. And people. yet, you know, because everyone's saying, oh, you know, we, we need to we need to start adjusting to the new normal. For me, it just, it's capitalism 2.0, really. There has been no, I mean, I don't blame any system or any individual for this. We've all been going through yeah. some very strange times. Yes. But 
capitalism will fight to the very end to maintain its status mm-hmm. quo, to maintain the, the, you know, the hegemony of the rich and etc. But but, it, it, God, I mean, early do- early doors, I thought, well, maybe something will shift. But increasingly, I just think it's got worse. Mm. As you mm. say, the, the social inequalities got worse. So I get, but but I guess. From from where we are, I mean, you, you you do a lot of campaigning, and I hope I I I try to do good stuff, but I also don't want to forget stories, and you know, particularly at the moment with the arts, I don't, I don't want to lose that sense of fun and playtime and music. Yes, and... absolutely. I think I think on the last word on the utopian thing, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, that amazing congresswoman, um, she and Naomi Klein brought out two little movies called A Message from the Future, which are worth watching okay. because they are actually quite um, beautifully realised visions of how we could live. Um, which is, I mean, none of it is pie in the sky. It is in fact common sense, and 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 it's common sense that. The, the capitalism we're living with now um, will fade and die because it's not sustainable, it's simply not sustainable. And and either that happens very violently and difficultly uh, with endless things like this happening again and again, um, because this isn't going to be the last pandemic, is it? We all know that. There's going to be COVIDs, all sorts of. Well, not if I mean, it's just another animals, disease. Take them from the trees or from from the caves. Well, and indeed, or, and animals. keep flying around like mad, and you know, there's be all sorts of things going to c- turn up. But if we actually change the way we live, we might be able to deal with them better. Yes. So, so those films are really worth I'll watching. They're only nine minutes long, eight minutes. They're very short, but um, and the first one's about the Green New Deal in America. And the second one is much more sort of um, uh, global, but but that's worth watching. That well, they're worth looking at on YouTube because I them. found them very helpful. When it when it comes to the um, elderly in your utopia, I I, mm. I there's one thing in my mind when I think about that, and I suppose people would look at your work, and a lot of people say, "Ah, oh, my favourite thing that you did was." in love actually because it broke people's hearts but the thing that really broke my heart was one line and really affected me i mean to the point where i just Mm. thought i've read this book a billion times why am i so utterly destroyed by this line is marianne in sense and sensibility when her sister is ill and and you're sat by the bed going Mm. please don't leave me on my own essentially i'm paraphrasing yes And, and that tapped in to this incredible feeling of that primal terror of loneliness. Yes. I genuinely yes. think that was honestly, that for me, you know, that was the most affecting thing that I've ever mm. seen you do. Because, and obviously you wrote it, but it it made sense of what we struggle with, what we've struggled with in isolation during COVID, what we struggle with as we get older, what we struggle with in relationships and we're trying to preserve a sense of autonomy as well as togetherness. Mm. But... It made sense of Jane Austen. It made sense. She's somebody I've always struggled with. And actually, no, she, that the idea that women were kept as, um, they were kept in sort of prisons, very polite, genteel prisons until they managed to be married off. And if you didn't get married off, life was an unrelenting, miserable hell. And it was, mm. uh, yeah, I've taken a big detour, but I just, I had that in my mind as you were talking about it. That was just a really great piece of work. Well, thank you. And you think about Jane Austen, of course, and her sister was called Cassandra. And um, (laughs) Cassandra was absolutely devastated when Austen died at the age of 42. With Epstein Barr, I think it was. I can't remember. But anyway. Was it Epstein Barr? um, Something like that. Something odd. I can't. One of those those double-barreled named illnesses. Um, which nobody knew anything about, but yeah, she was so 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 distraught, and you can you can imagine Eleanor's terror that somehow she'll just that's right, it's Eleanor. It'll just be her. Marianne's the sister, isn't it? And then Eleanor, yeah, is the, the sixth. Eleanor's sister. The, 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 the the no no Marianne's the sixth sister, and my character says, yeah, Marianne, please do not leave me alone. H- 
see that for me was like and it and it reminds me of I mean I'm very lucky I don't I I I don't feel alone I'm very fortunate in my life and I have mm. I have a lot of sort of connectivity mm. I think of my you know my grandma and I think of what you know and I think of also not having kids I guess and like what it oh my god what's gonna what's gonna happen but isn't it such a waste that we put that people can't live with their close to their grandparents I mean that's the care home thing can work very very well of course people can get on very very well but I I think we're very lucky because we've got my mum lives with us has always lived as it were right next to us and so so my kids have always had this old lady in their lives and I in my in my city old people and young people would be together all the time there'd there'd be constant interactions between the very old and the very young because they do each other so much good and the very young and the very old much much more patient with one another Mm. than people kind of slightly further down the line I mean my granddaughter my my I haven't got a granddaughter crying out loud my daughter <laughs> is much more Christ it's coming hopefully I'm not too soon aging during this podcast <laughs> um my daughter is is really patient with my mum and she's 20 and mum's 88 you know there's and I can be a bit oh god mum a bit nippy or minty if I'm in a bad mood or thing with both of them actually um so, so that relationship between the very old and the very young is a very important one. And we don't, well, don't, you know, in, I think it's in Norway, they now um, have old people's homes with young people, teenagers living there. And it's such a great idea. I think so. That's a kind of utopian ideal that's been tried and, and proven to work very, very well. So... And I think utopia is uh, dangerous things. So but well, that's just practical. It is, and, and it's you can provide, you know, subsidised housing for mm. people just leaving education or just going into apprenticeships, whatever situation they're in. Um, but they they live in they they live in the same block as smaller exactly. people. Exactly. Yeah. And they're just incentivised to go and sort of say hello to them. And the thing is, I just grew up thinking that old people just told stories about the war. Yes. And I'm so, um, my cousin just did some genealogical research into my dad's family and I just bawled my eyes out because I just thought, why didn't I ask him this stuff when he was alive? Mm. And I think when, when we knew he was dying, we were just so consumed with, are you okay? Are you frightened? Do you need biscuits? You know, those immediate mm. things. Mm. But I, I always I always feel that, that, that elderly people, uh, they're just, a, they're a mistrick. They really they're, are. Oh, they're totally a mystery. They're they're being wasted. All of their knowledge, all of their experience. I'm not saying that all old people are fabulous or all children are fabulous. They're not. No, there's some. Some old people are pricks. cantankerous, selfish. <laughs> self, and they're always the ones who live the longest as well. Let's be honest. It's the ones with triple but, lock pensions that tend to sort of survive. They'll survive everything. <laughs> There's kind of economic yeah. cockroaches of the um, the new Armageddon. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if you had. Uh, you need access to all ages and we're also um you know put into little silos and because it's easier to sell things to people who are in groups it's much easier to control them and to sell things to them whereas if you're in a group where you can go to somebody who's 80 and say do you think this is a good idea and they said well you know what i did exactly the same thing when i was uh, and this is what happened i mean it may not be relevant but and then there's a sort of buffer zone mm. between you and the stuff that we're constantly being sold. We're yes. just being sold stuff all the time. I mean, that, of course, is the computers and back to the social media and and the the endless and interesting algorithms your, that are controlling our lives. But the algorithm, it's, refl- it's really strange. It's not a one-way thing in some ways because you get to, as you see these adverts pop up as you're just trying to do something quite basic on your phone, you realise, oh, my yeah. God, this is me. Yeah. This is this is who you think I am. The other yeah. day I looked at the recommendations and thought, you think I'm a sort of teenage prepper. You think I'm about to go on a, either a killing spree or about to go <laughs> sort of loco in the countryside. Is it not a comfort to you to think, well, they've got me com- completely wrong, <laughs> those stupid bloody algorithms? Well, I yeah. mean, I'd be very comforted by that. Unfortunately, yes. I get adverts for, you know, incontinence stickers. <laughs> 
and you know absolutely accurate and I go no, no, nonsense no, you're, I mean, you're well known as having the strongest pelvic floor in the business as well you know it's, it's a stuff of legend I've worked on that pelvic floor <laughs> in my in my city there'd be whole pelvic floors areas where nothing would happen except pelvic floor muscles yes muscle type of you know classes Oh God! Oh, no, I'm I'm out. I'm out. Okay, no, I'm I'm, sorry. I can't. No, I just I've never been able to really embrace. I mean, I, I yes, I bought a little rebounder trampoline. So I have some sort of yeah. and and sort of happily fly around on that thing like a like a toddler. And um, a mate of mine who's had a few kids just said, "Oh, you know, the pelvic floor will go." And I went, "Oh bollocks, get on it!" Full flooding. I was like, "You've just weed. <laughs> You've just weed on my tr- mini trampoline." How can you just, I warned you, there was no shame. <laughs> you've got to be, you've got to be prepared for trampolines. You see, the thing is, childless as I, I've, I've been totally blasé. I'm literally bouncing up and down like a, but there's like, what is your problem? Mm. Full flooding. And that is rude. That's rude. Yeah. She claims that I was fair warned, but I had no idea. Well, yes, I'm in some sort of pelvic floor respite. You weren't making a laugh at the time, were you? I doubt it. It's unlikely. Mm. <laughs> it's unlikely. Um... I want to ask about the balance, I suppose, of, in your life, where you find it, your family life, mm. then you have your activism and the things that politically inspire and engage you. Then you have playtime and big wigs and mascara and fun. Yeah. And then you have yeah. writing, which is purposeful and painful and solitary. How, yeah. w- what of those things holds most sway and what will become, do you think, most important as you get older? Um... Well, I mean, I'm lucky to have any of those things, aren't I, really? I suppose that's the first thing. Family, well, family will necessarily, as you get older, you know, not obviously where I live in my my dream city, but you kind of lose people. You know, my mum's 88, so so she will die. And um, my daughter is 20, so she will move away and have her own family. So... um, you, you you know at the moment i'm sort of in between two still active caring arms towards one towards the essence of my mother and the ad, the post adolescence of my daughter mm. but i'm still very necessary to both of those people and when yes. i become less necessary or not necessary at all um then the balance of life will necessarily change because that's the center of it at the moment yeah, that's where i'm living at the moment because those are the you know, the most important things, the things that have to be done and they're the first priority. And then, and, and writing, of course, fits around anything, actually. You can write anywhere. Um, so so it's, very, it's, a, it's a very good thing to have lying around because if you have, if you have an accident or, you know, you're, okay, I mean, I hope I don't get COVID, but I suppose if I did and I wasn't able to do anything, or maybe I could just have brain fog and I wouldn't be able to write either. But uh, writing's useful in the sense that you you can do it anywhere. If I were having to care for my mum as I was in Scotland, because you know that's that was just the the job, um, I could write. So I, we're writing the musical of Nanny McPhee at the moment. So it's easy to make a a little a little space. Yeah. And right. So that that's a that those two things are very good. And that, then with acting, you've got to work out, well, who needs me? Am I able to go and do this job? Am I able to leave to do this job? Or actually, could this job happen in London? Because I love working in England and Scotland. I love working here. Mm. I prefer it to anywhere else. Um, so all the work that's that's possibly happening is all going to be here. And that's a great help because I don't want to travel so much. Did you always um, you know, resist the stateside life? The... Yeah. Because yeah. you won. When did you win Oscars? How old were you? About 32, 33. My God. The first one for Howard's End. And then I think I was 37 or something when I won for Census. The writing one. Bloody hell. How does, I mean, that, that's just the double by 37. Yes, but it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like that. It's not, it's not like that. Because, you, you you know, you, you're not even aware, you're not aware of it. I, I mean, I was so 
innocent about things like the Oscars. They, they weren't really a big thing in our lives here. They were, in I England. used to stay up and watch them. Yeah, but you're younger than me, sweetheart. But the, the, it was the most unspeakably glamorous thing from when I was a yes. kid. Because it's so outside of my realm of experience, achievement, whatever it might be. And also, you know, I, I happy childhood, but very the sort of endless rolling beigeness of, of, of Croydon. And <laughs> and I've played you know, Croydon. <laughs> we've all you play it once. Not even on the way up and the way down. You just play it once. <laughs> I played it once, the Croydon Warehouse. I had a very good audience. Do you know what the warehouse was great? It's the Fairfield Halls you've got to watch out for. It's a fab venue, but acoustically difficult. Acoustically very difficult. <laughs> God. Anyway, that's a very niche comment by me. But uh, for me, it was always like, maybe it was about the fact that people wore ball gowns, which I knew I would thankfully never have to squeeze myself into. But it's yeah. like, look, there's people in ball gowns. And they still managed to walk. And I used to feel so frightened when I would see them... Yeah. teeter up the steps yes and even then i think god what a what a needlessly stressful thing to make a woman do she's Indeed. already shitting herself that, exactly you know that she's got to pick this thing up don't and, and do a nice speech don't am i the, the shoes no and you just spend I, I can remember one year actually the year i won for the for sense and sensibility i had a pair of shoes on and i they just wouldn't stay on and they were too high and they wouldn't stay on and i was I think I got. What am I going to do? I can't get down the bloody red carpet in these. And I borrow. I, I who was it? Somebody was staying in the hotel. She was queen of somewhere. <laughs> I can't remember what country. She was, queen she was of a somewhere. fucking queen. And and I, I I was just passing the thing. And I said, have you got? Have you got anything I could? Have you got any sellotape? Have you all? It was or oh, one. And she said, oh. Actually, she said, I'm wearing um, some, you don't mind b borrowing these. I mean, I have been wearing these shoes and, and she had some insoles. She said, do you want them? So, and they were all kind of warm. <laughs> she hot was queen wearing insoles. Them. Hot, a hot queen's insoles I got. And I put them on and, and they saved my bacon, can I tell you? That is... That is majestic. The fact that you're, because I do imagine that everyone's just rubbing around, that all these sort of A-lessers rubbing their hotel. And the queen of somewhere, you didn't I even ask remember. where, perhaps you were too dazzled, where. gave you a hot insole so that you could teeter up and accept <laughs> this big bastard gold man. In that sense, high heels are quite a levelling experience, you know, because everyone's, all the women are in agony. I will not wear them anymore. I just, I just... Well, no, I find any any event, particularly an award event, so challenging that I need to mm. have something on that I can run away in. There are far too many of them. I mean, you know, the Oscars and the Globes used to be quite fun, actually, because they were a little bit less serious um, and taken less seriously because they weren't used in quite the same way to, to, to make money. Um, they were a celebration, if you like, whereas now... I think they've become, a, if you get your film, the Oscar, then the film will make that much more money, you know, and it's all gone a bit, um, a bit sort of lowering. But, but, the, but the, the thing itself, the, the event itself, because my mum came to both of them, is, is very um, surreal, very surreal. Mum was wearing a train, I remember, at one of them, and everyone who trod on it and yanked <laughs> her head back was famous. So she kept on going, um, you know, just being So she choked. had whiplash by the end yeah, of it. Yeah, whiplash by the end. But, you know, it was Placido Domingo who'd given her the whiplash. So it was Bloody okay. Hell. Yes, exactly. As long as there's a celebrity anecdote to go with the osteopathic crisis, <laughs> it's sort of, it's important, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I just find, I just find the idea of you at the, it's interesting. To, do you know what I mean? I mean, some, <laughs> some people are just, uh, that's all that's that's why they do the job oh yeah no 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 if that's why you do the job then i think that you shouldn't be doing the job no Usually you should just walk away from that because it's so so random and n n nonsense really yes. if everyone knows it's kind of mad and silly but if it can be fun and made theatrical and made fun to watch then then oh all power yeah, to them I've learned a lot. I've learned that you're now the benign, a benign dictator of a place where kids get taught, you know, how to trust their own instincts, where 
the elderly get listened to, their stories get properly sort of understood and passed down. And they're looked after by the young, where key workers are valued, where there's a pelvic floor arena where stories okay, are that's told. A bit, I've taken that too far. That was a gag. Take it's that in. out. It's in. The, constru- okay. the construction's already begun. This is the problem with dictatorship, is oh. that you say it, it's done. Oh, you're right. You're so right. It's done. Okay, but thank okay. God, the construction industry is being paid incredibly well because they're providing a key service to those with, with basically... Um, uh, bladders like wet plasterboard and then yes there's lots of greek mythology classes and mm. and norse legends going on there's a springboard for the imagination and for anyone in crisis in any social event there's a random queen from who fucking knows where with a hot insult <laughs> i'm signed up count me as your most loyal surf it's all good <laughs> and thank you for your time oh, it's lovely to talk to you sue all my love as ever and i'll see you in person yeah i hope so time. just the weirdness of times yes yeah. we just got to do a lot of breathing let go take care all that as always a big thanks and lots of love to emma i can't wait to live in her city and of course yes. the music for this episode and for all of the series is by waiting when for smith you can find more of his music on youtube and spotify all I do. Stare at you. I'll be heading east to find my peace where the desert feeds.